notice the number of television programs and magazines dedicated to the idea of design? I mean, everything from Home Extreme Makeover, Pimp My Ride, and entire cable networks devoted to this idea of design. Magazine racks are full of periodicals that focus entirely on, you know, gardening and home decorating and design of all kinds of uh, different areas. You know, why? Is it because our society is so immersed in materialism and stuff? Well, I think partly that's true, but I also think that the design is important and it matters. And I think, and I think that creativity and design and learning are inseparable. presentation is going to build on the ideas of Dan Pink and Sir Ken Robinson. These are two men who have done extensive work in this area of creativity and design and kind of build a foundation for this type of a presentation. The idea of creativity and design is something that all educators have dabbled with for a long time, but I wonder how, much of, how many of us have intentionally included it in part of everyday learning. Dan Pink talks about utility and significance, utility being being the, um, the, f the function and form and purpose of, of products and significance being that which makes it stand out. You know, increasingly as the Read Write Web allows us to publish and create content, we're seeing, we're seeing everything from some excellent work to, I think the majority, not very good. We've seen things that just, that, that we're spitting out all kinds of content that I'm not sure we've really considered design elements. My premise here is to help us create things that are both meaningful and beautiful. In this presentation, I'm going to talk about design in two distinct areas. First of all, I'm going to bring in three people who I think are experts in the area of classroom, school, and instructional design. We're just going to hear a little bit from them in terms of what they think are the most important principles in areas of design for those things. And then, I want to talk about some specific techniques that every one of you can incorporate in your classroom when it comes to design, in particular, of multimedia. Now, bringing these two ideas together might be a little bit of a stretch, but, but bear with me. And uh, if you wouldn't mind, please leave a comment or um, an idea that you have about design that could contribute to all of our learning. I think that's the power of, of a presentation such as this, is that we can continue the conversation and learn from each other. So for the next few minutes, I'm going to leave, and we're going to bring in these three uh, experts who are going to talk to us about design, and then we'll continue on with the presentation. I'm going to look at five key techniques that you can apply uh, to the area of design to hopefully have it make a more meaningful impact for your students. Christian Long is currently teaching high school English in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, but until this year he spent 10 years working in the area of school design. While not an architect, Christian's role was to work together with architects and educators in designing schools. We sat down and talked for about 15 minutes on, on his thoughts about school design, and this is just an excerpt from that interview. Two big ideas I took from our conversation was the focus on school design needs to be on learning and not on traditional ideas of school, as well as the innovative, innovative use of space by considering current assets that are available. And that is the moment we use the word school, we've already we've already framed the solution and we're greatly minimizing the amount of innovation we can come up with. So the moment that somebody says how many classrooms or how big do you want your school or do you want a gymnasium here or there, um, the vast majority of the, of the solution already exists because the icon of the school is already burned into our brains or our, our thinking process. So for me, one of the very first things you do early on in the planning process is you focus on learning and not school. Urban inner city school, um, the high school nearby was one of the worst in Boston. Um, and so she was, she was going to be working with kids who were already facing great challenges. And she had very little to start with. And so everything she had from literal teaching supplies to space was reallocated, was, was reimagined as whatever it was before it had to be used in a different manner. And, and here's what was interesting. They had taken what were, I suppose you could call them substandard, a substandard environment, and had made magic out of it. So instead of seeing it as a weakness, they suddenly were able to create opportunities for their kids and their teachers to collaborate, to think, uh, to go into a corner and to read quietly, to, to have more of an atmosphere that was conducive to, to human beings 
being creative with that and said, I have this vision of my kids being healthy instead of bemoaning the fact that we don't have a single space that looks like school. We're going to integrate the walk, which can be as much as a mile at a, at a time, as part of our curriculum. And, and so while that's not specific to architecture, she actually saw every architectural space um, constraint as an opportunity to create an asset map of learning, if that makes sense. This idea of constraints is, a, is an idea that we'll revisit uh, again throughout this presentation. Clarence Fisher is a middle years teacher who, among many things, is working at making his classroom a studio a place where learning is inspired and the ability to explore and innovate is encouraged. He discusses how classrooms focus on utility but not significance. You'll notice some similarities between Clarence's ideas and Christian's as he tries to create a space that allows possibilities and creativity to thrive. Uh, I guess if I'm giving somebody, you know, if I'm talking with someone about design, what I would ask of them is, what kind of things do you want to happen in your classroom? And th think about that um, and then make a space that allows that to happen. These institutional spaces that we work in, you know, and they're supposed to be home for kids, you know, 10 months of the year, six hours a day. Uh, they're, they're funny spaces, really, when you think about it. Like, I've, I've had this idea or almost an obsession for the past year or so about the idea of classrooms as studios. And I, I really can't tell you where that idea came from. Um, but I get into this idea of, uh, of, of, again, changing the possibilities in a space. And when I think of a studio, you know, I don't think of, you know, a teacher standing at the front and, you know, telling everybody, okay, now take your paintbrush and, you know, drag it this way across a paper. You know, a studio to me uh, is much more open. A studio may have a bunch of different things going on at the same time. Uh, a studio has, uh, you know, basically a, a master learner in it of some kind or a master of the profession who directs people who are, you know, still learning, you know, who are, who are advancing in that profession. And when I think of how we, you know, would like classrooms to be, to me that's an important concept because it really changes the role of the teacher, you know, from the fount of all knowledge to, you know, one of the people who's involved in the learning process in there. Um, it changes the role of the student from someone who is there just to, you know, basically be a sponge and soak in the information to someone who is active and involved. But then I also think a lot about design. Um, I think when you change the design of your classroom, it m opens up the possibility that new things can happen in that space. Uh, if you just think a classroom should look like, uh, you know, a bunch of desks and rows with a front and a back, then, you know, that when you walk into a classroom that looks like that, it brings certain things to your head. You know, it brings a certain idea of what happens in that space. I think Clarence's idea about um, wanting new possibilities really, t again, ties in with another principle I'll talk about later, and that is this idea of innovation and um, trying to allow uh, students to create things that are different and unique from what we've traditionally expected. Dr. Richard Schweer is a professor at the University of Saskatchewan specializing in instructional design. He values the use of technology to produce meaningful and significant work that combines purpose and beauty. Well, I would follow is that, that you, creativity lurks here. Um, uh, uh, to get away from a technical, rational approach to instructional design, you know, lay out the objectives, define the content, do a needs assessment, do a follow-up, yeah, do usability testing, all those kinds of things are good, and they serve purposes. But really the fun part of technology and instructional design happens where you're able to um, really think creatively and, and bring things to it. The other thing is the age-old adage in medicine, really drawn from medicine, but it, uh, it's known as the guiding principle, the overall caveat of instructional design, and that is uh, first, do no harm. And I think that's really important because you can create all kinds of stuff with technology that um, is a heck of a lot of fun to make, 
and really terrific at eating up resources and doing some good things that can look slick and even the students can like it, but it can literally do harm. Let's just say, for instance, that what you're really after is to get kids being creative and talking to each other and experimental. Well, then, would you throw drill and practice at them uh, as, as a technology, as an approach? Would you design in a way that would require kids to uh, uh, memorize a lot of information and uh, 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 practice with it at that level? Well, you might as a precursor to something, but if that's what you were after, you'd actually be doing probably some violence to the, to the whole notion of creativity. Yeah, first, does it work? And then, do, do, can you make it beautiful, powerful, inspiring, all of the extra things that make it work really well and make it really sing? So those are some guiding principles that, while it might be specific to their context, can also extend into other genres of design. So don't lose sight of these ideas as we forge ahead. And again, I, I, I know that there may be... Um, a difficulty for us to connect these dots. I hope I can do that for you. And also there will be links to the full interviews um, from these three gentlemen as well. This may seem a little obvious, but I can't tell you how many times I've seen teachers tell kids to make a PowerPoint or a movie, even a web page, with no pre-planning. I'm all for serendipitous creation and exploration, but if you ask kids to create some type of projects, they have to plan. They don't need to plan the same way, but they have to plan. Here's some examples. If you want kids to make a short video, storyboarding is critical. Now, storyboarding tools and templates like this might work for some, and others, just the back of an envelope with some written ideas might be better. As a teacher, you can include planning as part of your assessment. Put it in a rubric, but you have to include it. Don't pass out a camera. Open up a piece of software until you've reviewed the plan with your students. Included in the plan should be a clear purpose. We've done this with writing for years. What's the purpose of your movie? Is it to persuade, to be funny, to inform, to shock? Without a purpose or a target, it's going to be difficult to assess and analyze its success. Classes that podcast almost always use a written script and yet often visually based projects have little or no planning. Without a clear purpose, kids are just wasting time. You have to help them focus. This is actually a great opportunity for teachers who are less comfortable with technology to play an integral role in the development and the design of these projects. You may not know the technology, but you do know what's, what's effective communication. And this planning process uh, involves you deeply in helping kids to frame their ideas and make sure that what they're doing with these tools is going to be effective. Most of us are visually illiterate. As teachers we are very text literate and we recognize elements of good writing kids practice this and hopefully by the end of their school life they've become they have some understanding of what good writing looks like in a world that's becoming more and more visual we have to begin to understand what the elements of good imagery might include every class I think should learn about photography do your students understand the rule of thirds what about lighting have you taken time to have all your students understand at least the basic elements of good photographic design video has similar rules as well and need to be learned. Once kids have these understandings, they can begin to create and use images that are of high quality and convey powerful ideas all on their own. Visual literacy should be taught to all students. Have you ever attended a conference where the speaker used PowerPoints full of text and bullets? Please help me in my quest to rid the world of torturing PowerPoint. If we can do one thing to change this, it would be to create and use images that support enhanced ideas. PowerPoint is not a text tool, it's a visual tool. Take a look at these images. These are all from a set in Flickr that are examples of great slides. There's a lot more to utilizing presentation software, but this one change would make a huge difference. Bullet points and text are great for notes and handouts, not for presentations. That's not to say text is never to be used, but it must be used in different ways. 
Look at billboards, magazines ads to see how text can be used as a visual or to complete an idea. And video? Well, usually f the f student's first venture into video involves taking a camera and pointing it directly at a subject, usually from too far away, and then moving the camera from s the same vantage point. Simply asking students to consider multiple camera angles can make a world of difference. Before you give a student a camera, they need to look at exemplary work and analyze it to see what makes a good shot or an image. If you're going to be using existing images, learn to use a site like Flickr. Having students use typical images from Google or other searches not only potentially violates copyright laws, but are often of poor resolution and look awful in most environments. Flickr not only has a Creative Commons section which allows students copyright free images, but tools such as Flickrstorm have even more functionality. David Jakes has some tutorials on using this that I'll link to. And did I mention not to use clip art? Unless you're trying to create something cheesy or animated, clip art just doesn't cut it. If your students have blogs, have them include an image in their blog posts. Again, don't simply use arbitrary images that may or may not supplement their writing. Require them to consider an image that adds thought or builds upon their work. Have them think about something in a bit more abstract way. I subscribe to more blogs than I should. And often I skim through my aggregator looking for titles and subjects that I'm interested in. If scrolling through I happen to see a compelling or interesting image, I'll stop and take notice. We've had graphical web browsers for some time, so let's get graphical. What happens the first time you give a child a paintbrush and a canvas? Well, they usually fill the entire page with color. If you've ever allowed your students to create a slide graphic, you'll see them do something like this. Because the tools and features are available, they use them. White space, or sometimes called negative space, is an important design principle that's used in virtually every design field. Less is more. But even more important, it's a positioning key elements to create emphasis. White space sheds light on what's important. If everything has the same emphasis, it's hard to tell what's important. White space or simplicity in today's visual world is often a rare but welcomed approach. Apple continues to be a leader in design and simplicity in both their products and their advertising. The use of transitions can also be used to create emphasis. I'm not talking about transition tools within PowerPoint or movie software, but rather the concept of a transition to change pace or ideas. Podcasters like Bob Sprankle or Wes Fryer use short instrumental pieces to shift between introductions and main ideas. Horizontal rules are used in text, and in video, the classic cut between scenes should be the standard for about 90% of scene changes, but a fade, a dissolve, or even an occasional wipe can be used to switch between big ideas. While similar to white space, constraints can help students focus their ideas. Too often I've seen projects that are just too large in scope. Asking students to produce a five minute video might seem like a reasonable first video project, but I think it's akin to asking an eight-year-old to write a novel. Designing learning that is attainable and emphasizes conciseness builds skills everyone needs to practice. Gary Steger says that one advice he gives all students when creating multimedia is to edit it one more time and make it shorter. This requires students to spend more time planning and less time in production and certainly saves time in post-production. One of the best examples I've seen lately of a project idea that really gets at this concept of constraints is out of a business school application requirement. Dan Meyer, a math teacher and blogger, took this idea and ran with it and then invited others to participate in creating a four slide presentation. The slides were to in some way depict the individual in whatever way they wanted but should evoke the viewer to want to get to know that person more. The business school's intention is not simply to be able to graphically represent oneself but to do so in a constraint of four slides. If you view the contest entries on Dan's site, you'll quickly see the creativity and various design elements of all the entries. This project could easily be done at any grade level, and I'd suggest doing it several times a year and keep it as a portfolio item. 
Even with video, shooting lots of footage is a wonderful ability that we can all afford our students, but unfortunately, it requires students to edit, and rarely do they have the ability or desire to cut out most of what they shot. Watch sports highlights. They'll shoot a game with multiple cameras and choose three to five of the best moments that define the game. If you want to teach them about constraints in video, have them film an event and choose a five to three, three to five plays or moments that capture the essence of it. It's hard work, but will be and is a critical skill. I think we used to call it the main idea. It's move from paper and text to digital in images. Good writing, like good design, is about elimination. Dan Pink discusses significance in conjunction with design. Thinking differently is going to be a critical attribute in the future. We need to provide opportunities for students to try things and build significance and creativity in all of their work. Utility is enhanced by significance. We haven't been intentional at emphasizing design. Think about the typical create a poster assignment. How much emphasis is placed on good design? How much time is spent studying and discussing well-designed posters or slides? Does our assessment help lead students to focus on good design? My first rule of creating multimedia is to avoid templates. The template is fine for quick and easy productions and maybe sometimes that works, but it certainly offsets any desire to build significance. Even online tools like Bubbleshare or Animoto and others look great, but once you've seen three or four, they begin to lose their significance and creativity. Templates attempt to hijack the design process. Worse is when students begin with a template and then try to incorporate design elements that just don't fit. Whenever possible, start with a blank slate. Dan Meyer feels that even designing worksheets and handouts can have significance. Read his post and comments to see why. When trying to be innovative, Look at the advanced features of software and consider how those tools and features might be used to create emphasis. For example, most movie software has a slow motion effect. Using it sparingly can draw attention to a portion of your presentation that your audience will remember. It's similar to using literary devices in written media. Alliteration, used sparingly is effective, overuse it and it turns from significant to annoying. Branding is important, not only for companies and products, but for individuals. Whether it's the creation of a logo, musical or video intros to podcasts or other videos, developing a brand or theme is what helps sets our work apart. Whether it's Bob Sprankle's Room 208 podcast intro, Dylan's couch video intro, or Alan Levine's cog dog icon, these design elements distinguish their content and cue their work. I like Darcy Norman's rotating banner on his blog so much I stole the idea for myself. Visiting our blogs, you'll find a different photo that we've taken. Trust me, Darcy is the real photographer, but I do think it offers some innovation and branding that we all can take from. The idea of branding for individuals and classrooms is one that will continue to emerge as publishing continues to explode. Well, thanks for joining me. Um, and bearing with me through this presentation. I hope there's something that you've learned. And again, I would just welcome your comments and your ideas around, around design, things that you found successful and important. And if you disagree on any one of the ideas that I've presented, I'm, I'm more than happy to hear from you. And uh, you can leave a comment on the blog uh, or the wiki, whatever, whatever works for you. Drop me an email if, that, if that's something you feel more comfortable with. But again, thank you for watching Design Matters, and I hope it's something that you're going to consider deeply. Um, to embed into your classroom.